معالي الوزراء الحضور الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يسرني أن أرحب بكم وأشكر حضوركم ومشاركتكم لنا في هذه الجلسة انتجاما مع توجيهات صاحب السمو الشيخ خليفة بن زايد آل نهيان رئيس الدولة حفظه الله بإقرار عام 2015 عام للابتكار وتجسيدا لرؤية صاحب السمو الشيخ محمد بن راشد آل مكتوم نائب رئيس الدولة رئيس مجلس الوزراء وحاكم دبي رعاه الله حول الاستراتيجيه الوطنيه للابتكار يسرني ان اعلن عن اطلاق المركز لمبادره حوار الابتكار. هذه الجلسه التي ننظمها اليوم بمشاركتكم تحت عنوان مستقبل الابتكار في عمل الحكومي. هي الاولى في اطار سلسله من الجلسات نعقدها سنعقدها بشكل دوري لدعم جهود الحكومه للتحول نحو الابتكار. يشاركنا في الجلسه اليوم سعاده الدكتور جيف مالكن هو الرئيس التنفيذي لمؤسسه الوطنيه للعلوم والتكنولوجيا والفنون نسدا التي تعد احدى المؤسسات المتخصصه في مجال الابتكار في العالم. عمل استاذا زائرا في في مختلف الجامعات منها كليه لندن للاقتصاد ولديه العديد من المؤلفات في مجال السياسات والابداع والعمل الحكومي. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the invitation to give this Iftikar talk, which I will be doing in English. Uh, and uh, it is a great honor to be with such a distinguished audience and in such a beautiful room. There is a beautiful view there, and I apologize, you have to look at me instead of at the beautiful view. Uh, but I will share some, some thoughts uh, and some experiences on Iftikar, on innovation around the world, which perhaps will feed into how the United Arab Emirates can become a leader in government innovation, as well as maybe a, increasingly a leader in science and technology innovation as well. I will start with uh, this picture and ask you, what does this have in common with uh, these things, the internet, the World Wide Web. It was not business which landed a man on the moon, or invented the internet, or the World Wide Web. There is a great history of public innovation. I could add to this things like eliminating smallpox in the 1960s. But often we think of the public sector more perhaps like this, slow moving, crushed by change. Or if you ask people in business, they often think the public sector is more like this. Good at stopping things happening, tying things up in red tape and bureaucracy. So what I want to talk about is how, how do we get governments better, both at supporting innovation in business, society, but also innovation within themselves. And how do we mobilize the brain power of people like you, a lot of brains in this room, but also within all of your departments and agencies, how do you mobilize the brains of your staff, of your users, of your professionals, to come up with better ideas and make government more effective? My organization, as you just heard, is originated in the public sector became a foundation, we combine research, we run real live experiments with governments around the world, we support innovation skills, and we are also a commercial investor. So we are a slightly strange hybrid of different approaches to innovation. And in much of our work, we try to make sense of innovation through this spiral, and I will come back to this a couple of times in my talk. All, in any talk about innovation, you will see some version of this kind of framework because all innovation involves some movement from understanding opportunities and challenges, some way of generating ideas, some way of improving the ideas, some way of testing or measuring the ideas, and then implementing them and growing them to scale. And in our work, we try to be involved in each step of that way. 
So, for example, we develop new statistical tools for understanding emergent economic sectors like games industry or big data. We develop uh, new ideas through open processes. Uh, we organize evidence about what works. And we work all the way through investment to whole systems change. How do you change a whole system or a whole system of energy? I'll say a little bit about, uh, about these. Why does this matter? Why should any of you be interested in innovation? And some people would say the job of government is to administer. It is just to manage. It is to deliver. And most of the time, that is true. Most of the time, the primary responsibility of an agency is simply to do things really well. Do known things. But if you look at the economy, there is very strong evidence now that most progress, most productivity gains come from innovation. Some economists would say it's 80% of all progress comes from you know, innovation, which gives you new, new cameras, new building materials, new ways of making clothes. This is what drives progress much more than capital investment or even labor quality. This is the single most important fuel of the economy. And it would be surprising if the same was not true for government, if progress in government didn't equally depend on new ideas, but just as important, the adoption of new ideas. Innovation is as much about taking other people's ideas as it is about having ideas yourself. And I'll say a bit more about that. The other reason I think innovation matters is if you look across the developed world, there are important sectors where productivity is stagnating or even deteriorating. This chart shows that across the OECD countries, the more um, countries spend on healthcare and the more they increase spending on healthcare, the less successful they are in keeping people alive. This is a very surprising finding. But it is a symptom of systems which aren't working well. The US is the extreme example, the most expensive health system in the world, and probably the least efficient, certainly, in the developed world. So how, how do we change these around? How do we get productivity, growth, improvement into public service systems? In other fields, we have very mature answers. For hundreds of years, and certainly for the last hundred years, there has been huge investment in military innovation across the world. Half of public R&D in the UK, France, Russia, US, China goes to better fighter jets, better drones. And as a result, we have continual improvement in ways of killing people. Not always a good thing. Uh, we also have very mature science systems. Across the world, millions of people have jobs developing new ideas in nanotechnology or genetics, testing them, taking them to scale. Little of that existed 100 years ago. It's a new innovation system in science, and UAE is growing much of this uh, as we speak. In business, too, there are mature ways of doing innovation, and it is a large part of many people's jobs. Not just in big laboratories, this is Bell Labs in the US, which was the classic R&D center of the 20th century, which gave us microchips and all sorts of other innovations. But also in business now, many different kinds of innovation. Innovation in services, user-driven innovation in fields like sports, um, open innovation, where companies draw on the ideas of outsiders, design-led innovation, and I'll say a little bit about that more. Uh, and, and in software, innovation, open source innovation, of the kind which underpins the internet. So many different approaches, and these are increasingly well understood. This is the INSEAD index of innovation in the economy. Uh, I think it's wrong because it puts my country second, and I don't think we are second. But anyway, and there's a slightly worrying feature, perhaps for you, that 
so many of the top countries have very high levels of snowfall. But I'm sure this is not a cause of innovation. We don't yet have any equivalent for government, any league tables for government innovation. But I think this will come. And this will become one of the lenses through which any country, any part of the world will be judged. How efficient is its government? How good is its government at innovation? So, how should this be done? First of all, if any of you suffer from insomnia, that is, you cannot sleep at night, can I recommend you, you read this? This is a, a piece of work we did, my organization, two years ago, which was to summarize what had been learned across the world in innovation policy, policy to support innovation in the economy. And it is very boring. 20 reports, a thousand evaluations, looking at R&D tax credits, venture capital support, intellectual property clusters, you name it. But quite important, because we found across the world many countries were implementing policies which don't quite work, uh, which were fashionable, but not effective. But as I say, this is one to read at 2 a.m. if you cannot sleep. It is not full of fun. Uh, but we have nothing yet quite equivalent in the public sector. What's interesting in this global picture of innovation in the economy is that whereas 20 years ago we would have all just looked to Silicon Valley as the model, or perhaps to Germany or Japan, we now have a much more interesting innovation landscape. This is from a, a report my organization did last year on the Chinese innovation system. And in particular, how is China innovating in innovation with new methods of generating knowledge and ideas which are sometimes superior to Europe or North America. Brazil, India, and I'm sure the Gulf will also be pioneering new methods of innovation in the years to come. And this is a very, very global field. So for the public sector, what are the equivalents going to be? And how can you take ideas through this spiral? And in a way, the most important sort of question I would ask each of you to think about is how within your organization do you manage each step of this? How do you think about opportunities and challenges which may need innovation? So the challenge could be Ebola. The opportunity could be smartphones. How can you use smartphones in a different way? Then how do you generate ideas? There's a very famous saying about ideas by one of the few people to win two Nobel Prizes, who said the only way to have good ideas is to have lots of ideas and throw away the bad ones. But this is very difficult for government bureaucracies to have lots of ideas. And there, but there are methods for doing it. Then how do you develop them and test them? Most ideas are no good. The inventor of the light bulb, Thomas Edison, tried 10,000 different materials before he found the right one to make light bulbs. And all our observation of innovation is it needs lots and lots and lots of trying before you get to the right method. Again, quite unusual for public bureaucracies to do this. Then how do you organize the evidence, how do you deliver, how do you grow, and how do you change systems? What I'm briefly going to do now is show a few examples of both approaches to innovation across the world, and then a few examples of fields, and then I hope you will ask me some very aggressive questions, or disagree with what I have said. So first of all, um, so just before I do that, I just want to say one thing about what I mean by innovation. Sometimes people think this is the same as convention. That to innovate, you sit in a dark room and a brilliant idea comes into your head. And you reach a moment and then you solve the problem. I think of it differently. This is the, the iPod. Some of you may have an iPod in your bag. And many people think the iPod was an invention of a man called Steve Jobs, who was a genius. Yeah? Who just brilliantly invented this idea. This is completely wrong. 
If you look at the history of the iPod, first of all, you find out that before the iPod, there were many other digital musical devices on sale, none very successful. You find that these, in turn, were dependent on new technologies for compressing music, and the Sony Walkman pioneered the idea of holding music in your pocket. Uh, and Steve Jobs took all of those ideas without any embarrassment. In terms of iTunes, he shamelessly borrowed an idea from Napster. Some of you may remember Napster, uh, and he just stole it. Uh, and he took a number of ideas in terms of manufacturing uh, and miniaturization, partly helped by Foxconn in China. Every single element of the iPod was not original. Half of the elements were publicly funded by governments, mainly in the US, but his genius was pulling them together in a way that is useful and attractive. And I think most public sector innovation is much more like this than it is about invention. It's about having the mindset to be hungry to take ideas, wherever they come from, put them together in a way that is useful for running schools, hospitals, or welfare, or budgets. And this is the, the, the mindset which is needed. So how is this being done? Well, one of the things um, my organization has done in the last a few months ago was to work with Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, and to map what we call the I-teams, innovation teams and labs around the world. This is a report, freely, free to download, which does case studies on innovation teams in national governments, in cities around the world, most of which are quite new, where presidents, mayors, prime ministers have tried to create a dedicated capacity to accelerate innovation in just the way that I think is happening here. Uh, and they are very varied in nature. So this is one from the US, the I3 Fund, which was nearly a billion dollars for systematic innovation in education. Uh, Mind Lab in Denmark, some of you will know, uses design methods to understand customer experiences to reshape public services. Uh, Pamandu in Malaysia is in some ways more about performance management, but also has a role in innovation. Uh, PS21 in Singapore is one of the oldest, uh, with a whole range of different methods, including a new human experience lab. Anyway, it's worth reading these because we think every bit of a modern government should have something like an I-team or a lab to generate ideas, to test them. And all of these move very fast now. They're very unlike their equivalents of 20 years ago. They go straight into action, trying things in the real world, rather than producing very thick documents and policy documents, which is what I used to do when I worked in government. Um, so that's one set of new approaches spreading across the world. The other is much more like science, the use of formal experiments. So in most of healthcare, every new pill is tested with a control group to see who lives and who dies. This method is now increasingly used in development, for things like child nutrition programs, uh, in social, uh, social policy across Europe, and increasingly in education. Again, testing new models of learning, but with a control group to see who learns better. And three months ago, at Nesta, we launched a new laboratory with seven countries as partners, testing support for business, for the first time ever in the world, testing business support using control groups to see which small firms grew and which didn't. Did the ones who received support grow faster than the ones who didn't? And this is a big trend globally. The other trend is the use of open innovation methods. So I mentioned in business, there's increasing uh, a use not just of in-house research laboratories, but also of ways of tapping into the brilliance, the ideas of other inventors, small firms. Procter & Gamble has been doing this for many years. 
Uh, InnoCentive has become a famous platform for linking technology problems to solutions from hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people answering them. And in Nesta, we created a center for challenge prizes using the same methods, sometimes with business, like Google, but sometimes with governments. So the government would set a challenge uh, like changing energy usage or reducing isolation for the elderly. And earlier this year, we revived a very old government uh, challenge. 300 years ago, the British government offered a money prize for anyone who could find longitude at sea, where a ship was in the sea. And the prize was won by a very humble clockmaker uh, who was much better at solving the problem than the very famous scientists of his day. And so we relaunched that with the government, with the BBC, and Amazon as a new era, £10 million prize for the global challenges of our time. But these methods are, are widely used at a much smaller scale now in governments across the world. Another big trend is working with psychology and motivations. Some of you may have heard of nudge and behavioral economics. We now co-own co with the British government a team called the Behavioral Insights Team who use behavioral psychology methods to change policy trying out new ways of communicating with the public to get them to pay taxes or not to leave litter. Uh, many of you will have seen in hotel rooms messages which say 90% of people who use this room reuse their towel. And this makes you more likely to reuse your towel because we want to be like other people. And there are many examples like this of the use of, in some cases, quite simple psychology to deliver better results. And the Behavioural Insights team in the UK is thought to have already saved about £500 million pounds in the last few years just through using this method in mainstream public services. There's then the spread of use of big data. Again, you will be familiar with this. This picture is just one I, I quite like from Korea, where the city has tracked people's mobile phone patterns, where they are going, through tracking their phone, in order to design bus routes. So they see where are the places people are going and there are no buses, and they redesign the bus route to go where people are going anyway. It's a very simple example, there are many, many others, of using the vast quantities of data generated by the public, and more here than anywhere on Earth, because you have more smartphone use, I think, than anywhere, to redesign services. Uh, we run at Nesta a thing called the Open Data Challenge series, where we take bits of public data and encourage teams to compete to generate value out of that data. So, for example, we've just done a challenge on education and jobs, and the winner has a way of linking data on pay and job opportunities to what... Uh, what um, choices teenagers make in school, so that you can know if you are choosing this subject, in 10 years' time you are most likely to be earning this amount, and if you choose this subject, you may be earning this amount. So you're using data to change choices in a public system. Many other examples like that. And out of data, another growing field is predictive analytics. So using algorithms to predict future problems for the public sector. So this is an example from the US of police uh, forecasting. So this is used in many cities now. So looking at patterns of crime activity in the past, you predict where is then the most likely place to have crime on a Monday evening. And it may be a particular street corner, so you send your police there to be ready for the crime to happen. Of course, it's very important that criminals can't see this, otherwise they will go to the places where the police are not going. Um, and, and there's a lot of use of this in prisons. In the UK, we've used this in health now for 15 years, so every doctor uses a thing called PAR, so when they see a patient, it predicts how likely is this patient to come into hospital in the next year or two, and then depending on that prediction, you can provide extra help 
to that patient to make it less likely that they do come into hospital, because it's much more costly if they do come into hospital than helping to prevent that uh, appearance. So uh, uh, a growing field of, of predictive analytics. One of our obsessions in, in our work in innovation is how do we combine creativity and new ideas along with measurement and assessment of what works and what has impact. And one of the lessons of experience is that many really good ideas don't work. Or they seem to work, but don't. And so we have generated what we call this standards of evidence framework, which has now been adopted by several governments, some multinational companies as well, where for any intervention, you try to describe where it is on these levels. Level one, you can describe why it might work. Level two, you have some data to show it works. Level three, you have a control group. Level four, you've repeated the experiments, and so on. And we found this very useful as a really common language for talking about impact. One of the projects which stimulated this was a project in America called Scared Straight. And this was a project which got former criminals to go into schools to talk to children <laughs> to scare them off becoming criminals or drug users. And everyone thought this was a brilliant scheme. And billions of dollars were invested in it. It spread all over America until someone had the idea of testing it with a control group. And guess what they found? The children who went into the classes with scared straight were more likely to become criminals, not less likely to become criminals. But it was only through rigorous assessment that you could find out. And this happens all the time, that apparently promising ideas just may not work. So we need creativity, but we also need uh, evidence. I mentioned at the beginning why I think adoption is so important. We need more adoption of other people's ideas. And we shouldn't be embarrassed about it. And I would always ask of you know, of officials in any department, what have you adopted recently? What good ideas have you taken? We've experimented in the UK taking this a step further, using big data sets to track how good doctors are at adopting best practice. I think this is the first in the world where we've gathered a whole series of data sets, so now for each individual doctor, we can find out how quickly they adopt proven medical practice. And I think this is quite important because I would like my doctor to be good at adopting new knowledge in medicine. And this is the first time we can find out. And you can imagine in the future the same for every school or every police force, where you track speed and effectiveness of adoption of proven methods. Anyway, it's an idea. Nowhere has done this to scale yet. I'm going to give just a, a very few examples before opening up for, for, for questions and conversation. These are live examples of different kinds of public innovation, which I think are, are, are interesting in different ways. So this is probably the biggest one in the world at the moment. Are you familiar with this? This is the Indian UID card project, where the Indian government decided to give one billion people a biometric identifier card. And this was to underpin banking, to stop corruption, all sorts of things resided on this. They did it by bringing in a very successful <laughs> businessman, one of the founders of Infosys, and they ran it almost like a military campaign uh, with huge success. It's not perfect, but it's probably the large, largest, most ambitious public innovation project in the world at the moment. And an interesting one to look at for the methods it used which were very different to traditional Indian bureaucratic methods. Uh, and I think everywhere in the world will we'll be needing some versions of this before long. A very different example is universities. Universities are going through an extraordinary wave of innovation at the moment, mainly using um, online tools, uh, MOOCs they're sometimes called, so turning the university from just a place where you sit in rooms like this to online education in things like uh, Udacity, Coursera, uh, the Khan Academy. Now personally, I'm a bit skeptical of many of these, 
Most of them don't quite work yet, mainly because people find it very hard doing online courses and finishing them. We still like face-to-face -face interaction. But these are a very important example of or it's a challenge to universities, which I think they need to respond to by changing the way they work. Whatever else is the case, universities in 10 years' time will not look like they do today. And the smart ones will be quick to take the best elements of these, but leave behind the elements which don't work. A very different example is a, at a younger age in schools, which has been one which I've been involved in called studio schools, where our, our prompt was that in many countries in the West, a lot of teenagers don't really like going to school, or they find it boring going to school. So we worked with teachers and teenagers and businesses to almost design from scratch a different kind of school, which would motivate teenagers. And the model we came up with, is called a studio school, does most of the curriculum through real-life projects, working with businesses, working in teams, and often being paid for the work. These are just a few pictures from the studio school in Liverpool, in England, which is linked to the computer games industry. So from 14 onwards, the pupils work with small companies in games, designing games, uh, learning coding, software, and feeling very, very highly motivated. And many of the things which will happen in this center happen in this school. They have laboratories, they have experiments, they have you know, open uh, processes. And the curriculum structure here is almost the opposite from the curriculum structure of a traditional school in England, or France, or the US. You can't quite see this. So instead of it being based around geography, history, math, it's based around things like uh, communication, enterprise, emotional intelligence, and creativity runs through every aspect of the curriculum. In a way, this is a schooling model to prepare a generation to be innovators, not just observers, not just consumers. And I and is now spreading uh, in the US, Brazil, India, all now have studio schools. This links to another so aspect of education, which again we see happening very rapidly across the world, which is getting some of those skills of computer science, of coding, making websites, making apps, making robots, to a much younger age group. In the UK we did this through uh, platforms, through funding clubs in every school, like code clubs, and through things like Minecraft. Many of you will have children who play Minecraft. And uh, this was one route into getting children uh, engaged. So Estonia, in Europe, probably <coughs> leads the world. I hope the UK may be second. But again, this is embedding deep into the population. Now, from five or six onwards, habits of digital making, habits of innovation, habits of practical experiments, very different <coughs> from, say, education a generation ago. Now, very quickly, say something about health. I mentioned at the beginning the productivity challenges of health systems in countries like the US or France. They are very acute in countries where money is short. So we've been looking around the world for one of the methods which help to really improve the health system and save money. And the methods we have developed with partners are, I think, relevant to public sector innovation more generally. What we've tried to do is create what we call a rapid results process, which takes part of the system, so it could be equivalent to maybe one of the Emirates, taking all the people working in health, in the hospitals, doctors, NGOs, families, and giving them a very demanding target of changing the whole system within 100 days, providing lots of input with data and coaching and support, um, getting them publicly to commit to a target, so this is one month a few, in the summer, a 20% reduction of unnecessary hospital admissions in one month, and ending up with a completely redesigned system, much more focused on support in the home, on prevention, 
much better ways of sharing data between every part of the system, shared assessment tools, shared diagnostics, and so on. I won't go into the detail of this. The point is that I think there are some methods of rapid, very rapid innovation in the public sector, which will be increasingly important because the big gains in fields like health don't just come from making the hospital better, they come from making the system which links the hospital to the doctors, to the home, better. And this is a, a very common finding in engineering. If you just optimize one part of the system, you may leave the rest of the system very suboptimal. So you have to think whole systems in areas like health, or energy, or education, if you want the gains. So a couple of words of conclusion um, before you ask me some aggressive question. <laughs> For me, some of innovation is quite complicated, but some of it's quite simple. And the mark of a department or an agency which is doing innovation well is that people can have easily a conversation about three things. People at every level, from a minister to the front line. First of all, they roughly know what's proven. What's, what's the knowledge out there? What things have been shown to work, and therefore what deserves to be adopted? In any you know, really good area of business, or in any really good area of science, everyone working in the field knows roughly what's proven, what's the state of knowledge. They're then able to have a conversation about what's promising, what are the new ideas bubbling up around the world, which at least you should be aware of. They may not be fully proven yet, but they can be prompts about how to do things differently. So I think the MOOCs in higher education are definitely not proven, but they have promising elements, which at the very least are worth looking at. And then finally, what's possible? If you had a free hand, what would you experiment with? What would you try out? What, given your knowledge, perhaps as a doctor or an official, what things do not yet exist that are worth trying? And I think we need ways within every department at every level to have these conversations more often, to tap the brain power of the people around you, but systematically to set down what is proven, what's promising, and what's possible. Now, much of this is very, very old thinking, but in a good way. I live about a mile from this institution, which none of you probably will have heard of unless you work in agriculture. But I, I mention this because it's an interesting example, Ross Hampstead Research. It was created in the 1840s by two men uh, as a laboratory for farming. And they tested out different, different crops and fertilizers for different crops. At that time, population was going up fast in Europe, and crop yields were going down. So the world faced starvation, a pretty serious problem. They developed a laboratory which tested these different crops in bits of land, tried out different fertilizers, measured which crops grew and which ones died, and then created a business around the fertilizers which were successful and the, the crop versions which were successful. They become, became hugely rich. The world adopted nitrogen fertilizers and staved off starvation. Most of what I think we're talking about in public sector innovation is only repeating what they knew in the 1840s. That is to say, how do you systematically try different things, experiment, how do you measure which ones work, and for the things which are successful, how do you take them to scale and make them part of daily life? Almost nothing, I've said, goes beyond what was common sense at Rothamsted 150 years ago. The hardest thing, though, and I will end with just with this picture in innovation, is in fact not coming up with the new ideas. You all probably have lots and lots of new ideas in your head every morning before breakfast. This painting is the favorite painting of the people of Britain. I don't know if any of you recognize it. It's by a painter called Turner, and it's called The Fighting Temeraire. And it shows this old sailing boat being pulled into port by a little steamboat, and the old sailing boat is going to be broken up. This is a painting about the end of an era. 
the era when these sailing boats were finished were re replaced by steam. And the reason I show this picture is because in almost all innovation, you only get really space for the new to grow if you get the old out of the way. And usually it's much harder getting the old out of the way than it is coming up with new ideas. And it's particularly hard because often the old looks nicer than the new. And we have attachments to it. There is sentiment, there is meaning in that beautiful old sailing boat where the little steam tug looks ugly and unappealing. And yet, if you're serious about innovation, you have to do this all the time. You have to constantly make space for the new. And in most of the world, certainly in Europe and North America, the old will not make way for the new. And this is the heart of the problem for the public sector, is even when it has nice new pilots and projects, the old ways of running schools, or prisons, or police, or health, just carry on, even when they don't work. So that's the, that, that's the heart of the challenge for the centre and for, the, for you all, is how you both create the new, but also make space for it. But UAE has huge advantages in that respect. Now, your speed of operation, your flexibility, your dynamism is completely in a different league from the old structures of Europe and North America. And that's why, to end, I hope um, that, uh, my God, what's happening here? Uh, that you may, in your public sector, have some things a bit more like the moon landing. Some very bold, very ambitious, dramatic and memorable public sector innovations which remind people government has absolutely every, as much right to be a creator of the new as the most dynamic business, as the most dynamic science. Thank you. Thank you. I think there is, is there time for some questions or comments or disagreements? And there are some microphones perhaps for anyone, there's someone at the, at the back there, I'd like to, and here as well. Shall I get a... Uh, I have a story. I'm Mr. O'Connor Affairs, uh, future program uh, leaders. Um, first of all, thank you for your uh, presentation. But you made it very easy, like easy to implement the private sector innovation criteria to the public sector. Um, but actually, in real life, um, I don't think so. Um, so please, um, would you please mention what kind of challenges that we might face in public sector in terms of implementing the innovation culture? And uh, how long uh, roughly it, it takes to create that kind of uh, culture? Uh, because as you said, it should be um, early stages, like uh, at school, that you can um, change the mindset to be an innovative person. Thank you. You must have some answers in your mind about why it is difficult in the public sector. But what do you think are the main difficulties? Um, it's a new culture, and um, we're always um, thinking about budget um, and um, adoption. Yeah. And we, uh, we are not used to think that way before. I mean, usually people say the main barriers to innovation in the public sector are about risk, fear of things going wrong, uh, fear of introducing some new approach which may work for some of your population but not for others, fear maybe the media will attack you for an experiment. And any experiment does involve risk. And so it's correct to be nervous about innovation. Partly, part of the answer, I think, and what's being done by these I teams around the world, is experimenting small and fast. So you control the risk by doing your experiments, uh, maybe over weeks or months, with a few people, rather than experimenting on whole systems at once. And with every element of innovation, I say risk should be managed, not ignored. And uh, how you do it. So you know, it would not be a good thing if everyone managing traffic systems in Dubai experimented with the traffic lights every day. Let's change the colours. 
No. Uh, this would not be, a, 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 because the risk is, is too high. So there are some very practical, legitimate barriers to innovation, but all of which I think can be answered. And then the culture question, how fast can a culture change? Pretty fast, I think. Um, but it depends on leadership from the top. And it's very important the leadership signals that innovation matters. <laughs> And it's very important the leadership signals that some experiment and even some failure is to be expected along the way to greater success. Michael Bloomberg was a very interesting example as mayor of New York. Um, when one of his officials did an experiment which failed, and so long as the failure was not because of mismanagement, but was just because it, was, it didn't work, he would take them to dinner. And he made sure that everyone could see he was taking them to dinner. So that was just one signal from the top that an innovative culture was valued. And then I think the next thing is mobilizing your, your champions across the system. Not everyone will be an innovator. Not everyone should be an innovator. But within any department, there will be some people who are naturally hungry for ideas, hungry for experiment, and they need nurturing, training, support, both from the top and from the side. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm a from the Ministry of Economy. We have no doubt that such a government like the UAE have so many initiatives to be a very creative. My question is a bit technical. When we are discussing among, among us different way of measuring innovations, we do have a bit of challenge here, for example. It's not only the intellectual property, it's not only the R&Ds and uh, training the human resources. When you say, for example, a company like Alfred, 400 billion modest driver, only 15 million out of that is physical. Over here, when we find major innovation, I have a mandate to reach about 5% my GDP in innovation and by 2021. How, how do you measure that in a real uh, economic, uh, tangible uh, uh, way? Because it is so many thoughts, so many schools of thoughts when it comes to million individuals. I'm very glad you asked that question. If I had to plant one question in the audience, it might have been that question. <laughs> because this, this is a, a big theme for my organization. As you say, across the world, the main ways innovation is measured in economies are either the numbers of patents produced or the input, how much do you spend on R&D. And so countries set targets for inputs to R&D, some of which may be well spent, some of which may be badly spent. So the way Nesta has come at this is, is in two or three different approaches. First of all, over now about 10 years, we've been de developing different tools for measuring intangible investment in the economy as a whole. And I was showing colleagues here yesterday what that shows in the private sector is there is spending on R&D, always within the private sector, but that's only about 10% of innovation investment. Usually there is investment in design, in software, in organizational development attached to uh, innovation and so on. Companies like Apple spend almost nothing on R&D in the classic definition, but it's clearly a very innovative company. In service sectors like tourism or finance, again, there's no formal R&D, and yet there's big investment in innovation. And we've shown that for sort of many of the most developed economies, innovation investment is usually 11, 12, 13% of private value added, not so 2 or 3% of R&D. Uh, this intangible approach has been largely adopted by the OECD, who are now developing much more sophisticated intangible measures, <coughs> broken down by sector. And I think these, these will become part of the toolkit of the 21st century economy. These measures like patents and R&D input are completely <coughs> anachronistic. They should, they should be dropped. Uh, and... Um, <coughs> We are also working at the moment with the Malaysian government in adapting these not just at the national level, but for individual companies. 
So companies are encouraged to report on their innovation spending under these same categories, like design software. And in Malaysia, they think this will be a source of comparative advantage to have their companies be incentivized to invest more in innovation by making it more visible to capital markets. Now, there is nothing comparable for the public sector at all. And one of the things, again, we were talking a bit about this yesterday, I think a priority for the next 10 years for bodies like the OECD is to develop comparable innovation investment language for public sector departments led by finance ministries. Because at the moment, no department anywhere in the world can say what it does spend on innovation, what would be the right amount to spend on innovation, what's the return. And then secondly, I'll be very brief on this, the other statistical measure we've developed at Nesta is looking at jobs in terms of creativity. And we've analyzed every job by five dimensions of creativity, how novel is the, the work involved. Uh, and the UK government has now adopted this as a measure. It shows about 10% of our economy is creative in the sense that jobs in those fields are growing four times as fast as jobs overall. They are much more resistant to automation by robots. They are important not just in the creative industries, like advertising, design, etc., but also in fields like engineering, and aerospace, though the numbers are much smaller as a percentage, and even in public administration, there are some creative jobs by this measure. And for us, and in our conversations with governments, the key implication is how do you get schooling to prepare, prepare children for creative jobs. And part of the reason for schools like studio schools is to ensure that 18-year-olds, 21-year-olds coming out of education aren't just good at history or maths, but have experience of creative problem solving, because that's where, not all, but many of the jobs in the future will be. There's a long answer to your question. My name is Saeed Lath from Ministry of Cabinet Affairs. Actually, we might not land something on the moon very soon, the UAE government, but, but definitely we'll land something on Mars by 2021, yeah. thanks to Sheikh Mohammed. Yeah. I think the, 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 the UAE, there's a different case here where uh, the leadership of this country is way ahead uh, most of the sectors here, whether they are public sector or the private sector. And there are some limitations to the innovation in the public sector. My question is about how far we can go in, in, in the public sector innovating things and doing things uh, differently. I mean, there are some limitations when it comes to final, uh, funding these changes or these innovations. How can the public sector get the private sector intelligence and uh, money into changing the public sector services, schooling, infrastructures. Is there any way we can tap or we can, add? because because UAE is a, is a very unique place where we have lots of big companies, huge companies, they are making billions of dollars of profits, but may, mainly their, their uh, services or, the, or their income is coming from real estate and normal export, import uh, business. How we can get these uh, huge companies to tap or to help the public sector improving their uh, service and create and being uh, more innovative? And also, can we? Is there any way we can tap into like the the public money? I mean, by, by public money, but I don't mean the money owned by the government. The money owned by the public. I mean, uh, a few weeks back, we have an IPO here in the country. The company were well, asking for 2.5 billion. They get more than 120 billion dirham. We are very rich people, but we need. Can we use that money to improve the government service? Because at the end of the day, it's the future for the whole nation. Okay, well that's a that's a big question, and I'm certainly not qualified to answer most of it. But two, two or three. My pen, sir. <laughs> two, two or three elements which which may be of interest. So first of all, we run a joint center with our cabinet office called the Center for Social Action. And it was set up by our Prime Minister with the goal, slightly different from what you said, but its question was how do we mobilize the public, members of the public, to help improve public services? 
And the sort of projects we do include people acting as mentors in schools, small business people helping unemployed people get a job, uh, volunteers in hospitals helping hospitals be better. It's an amazing set of projects. But the one I would have mentioned is relating to coding and computing. So in trying to get our schools much better at preparing children for the digital age, our problem is most of our teachers don't know computing. The kids know more than the teachers. So we've had to go to the big IT companies and get them to encourage their employees to volunteer in large scale to help out code clubs linked to schools. And I think there's an equivalent of that in many fields where the most valuable expertise does sit in the private sector. How can you get it into public organizations? There's then a second thing, which is how do you get the private companies actually showing different ways of running public services? And all over the world, there have been experiments for 30 or 40 years of private companies running hospitals, schools, prisons, even police forces. I'm a little bit skeptical, because most of those haven't worked very well. Um, the very best have been very good and offer very different ways of organizing things. The very worst have been much worse than the public sector, and the average has been about the same in countries like the US or the UK. So the, what I think the public sector therefore needs is to be open enough to the private sector so you get the good examples, partly so you can then borrow their ideas in your public organizations. But the idea that just opening up to privatization will give you a better school system, a better health system, or better prisons, has, been, has not happened again and again and again. Even though you will find many consultants pretending it has. This is where evidence is, is really important. Um, there's an interesting financial innovation which may be uh, worth looking at, called the Social Impact Bond. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. Just give me one minute on this. This was a, a new way of using <coughs> finance to achieve some of what you described. And in a social impact bond, the government says, we will pay anyone who can achieve outcomes such as that prisoners do not reoffend, or that children finish their school successfully with qualifications. And this is then turned into a bond, which can be invested in, by private banks or individuals, and then a grouping of others, which may be private companies or NGOs, do the work to achieve the outcome. So it takes the risk out of the government, it brings in new expertise, new ideas, and the government only pays if the outcome is achieved. So finance ministries love this idea. Um, and we have about 25 of these in the UK now, they spread to US, Germany, Hong Kong. It's one of, I think there'll be the many innovations of this kind which use money in a creative way to solve some of the problems you described. And then the final answer, um, which may be of interest, is um, our government has been very interested in encouraging public sector teams to leave the public sector and become mutuals or private. And their theory is that if you are operating more like a self-organizing unit with a contract for running health services or schools, you will be more creative, more open, more dynamic than you are part of the public sector pyramid. And we now have 40,000 employees have moved into mutuals in the last five years, uh, about 100 of, of these organizations. And my, my hunch is these will work to make the public sector more dynamic. And in a way, they answer the, the starting point of your question. They make, as it were, the bottom of the pyramid, take responsibility for change and innovation, and don't require it all to come from the top. But at the very least, it's worth looking at that experience to see if lessons can be learned. And it was driven from the cabinet office, even though it's empowering frontline staff to run their own teams.